Nem, tak. Most már nem értem. Anyway, so it's been uh, so question. Uh, is it possible to um, plan? I mean, it could be a Zoom meeting or uh, a real, you know, kind of uh, how say face-to-face -face meeting where we have uh, uh, the international kind of platform come to Palestine. We'll be very happy to host. The organization for science, you know, and uh, women science, and kind of launch a major or organize a major event here where we show case uh, women uh, in science in Palestine, and you flag and you really elevate the status of what my uh, colleagues have been doing. That would be marvelous. Two, it would be nice if you can organize visiting scientists, women scientists to Palestine. That I can arrange. I mean, I can really go far in making this possible. So you identify scientists, women scientists in the organization from Asia, from Europe, from Latin America, whatever, who would like to come to Palestine for a month, for a summer, uh, to uh, give you know, a short course in one thing. We would be very happy to take care of the logistics, of the hosting, of the whole works. Uh, so just, you know, again, you create a pipeline with uh, women science in the world. Well, that's wonderful, wonderful offers. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that we can work together. Definitely. I mean, actually, we're just putting together some new programs now because we've had to rearrange a lot of things because of the lockdown. Um, right. And but regional workshops are becoming, you know, more and more important. Awesome. Maybe the international mobility is a little bit reduced, but that the regional movement is still feasible. Right. And then we're thinking of, of, for the moment at least, focusing on some on regional workshops. Uh, we're also thinking of doing quite a lot of hybrid activities so that you could have a, a base at the national chapter, for example, the right. Palestine <laughs> national chapter could uh, host an event, which uh, could be attended by whoever can attend right. the person, but then right. it's linked online to other countries. Have um, you done anything in Jordan, Tunis, uh, Egypt? We have uh, national chapters, a wonderful new national chapter that was launched last year in Jordan. And Huda Basali, who's also on this call, was, was very involved in, ah, great. in that. And great. Um, Egypt, we have one of the oldest national chapters established in Egypt. So Hola. yeah, we also have wonderful. very a very, very strong um, national chapter in Sudan. Hola. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking to, right. to build more, obviously, but um, yeah, so that would be also fantastic if, if uh, Palestine was able to be a kind of, uh, you know, a focal point for those chapters, it would be right. great. Right. Just that all roads lead to Palestine. <laughs> what can I say? It's our destiny that everything comes here eventually. The whole world is uh, cutting Palestine you know, just arranging it and, you know, just uh, referring to the Trump business and uh, annexation and, I mean, the whole world is busy reconfiguring Palestine and just, uh, you know, today we had a cabinet meeting for five hours discussing what this means, just amazing. I, oh. So I'm saying it's really uh, uh, even the more reason that we highlight that Palestine of resilience and of of innovation and of science and research and you know it's really important because there's such so dark clouds are kind of you know around Palestine and we need to kind of bring that light so your initiative as I see it that way you know amidst all the uh, well, entropy and all of that you're coming up with this amazing anyway I will stop my romance and say goodbye <laughs> uh, Dr. Marwan I have a question now, yellow. Okay, so uh, I would like also to emphasize, I, I just want to uh, remind everybody that we used uh, to have like a big uh, launch ceremony on March 7th that was canceled because of uh, uh, the corona right. and uh, we were very excited about, you know, launching it uh, like um, formally, but uh, I hope that we can do this uh, uh, very soon. But yeah, I wish that from uh, His Excellency as a palace uh, CEO and as a minister to always, and I know that you, you, you want to do this like from your heart, to always right. support uh, in all, you know, 
grants and fellowships by giving not a quota just to give them yeah. like uh, the support because of um, what we usually see the age you know the age discrimination uh, when we have uh, you know an age limit on things so uh, and I know some countries do that that when they say like it's 44 men it's at least give 40 mm -hmm. Seven for women because we know that we have things that make us, you know, at least, you know, lagging behind men, uh, which is the best thing in the world, which is motherhood, that make us sometimes <laughs> timeline. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we need not right. a, a support for our uniqueness that we have. Mm -hmm. the, the answer is yes. Uh, you can count on that to the extent we possibly can. There's one thing immediate we can do, mm -hmm. you know think it's the right thing to do, and that is have your organization represented in the various committees of the academy. So the Canadian bridge, you will have a member by virtue of being in your organization, not a personal capacity. Perfect. And German, various committees with the German bridge will have yeah, we'll represent have more, and various advisory groups and uh, even societies. I mean, we We'd be happy to actually flag and you know make explicit that you're already present in that with that hat. If you think this is the right thing to do, we'll do it. Yes, that will be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And do you have a website? Uh, a website? Yeah, we have a, a website inside Palast. Yes. Me, yes. Is it well and up and is it good? Then you're happy with it? Yes, and we have a Facebook now. We just worked on it. It's like just, I think, a few weeks. Amira? Yeah, like yeah. we do have a Facebook now, by now, and it's very active. Thanks to Ayman. Uh, mm -hmm. And thanks to Balas as well. <laughs> we shouldn't forget. Uh, yeah, so, so it's very active. Working on the website, so? Uh, we yeah. don't have a website yet, but we do have a Facebook. And we announce everything on our Facebook because people usually they go to Facebook rather than website. So like that's why we just only wanted to save time. Yeah, Amazing. but I think we are working, Ayman, we are working on a website to be like as a... Can I say also that yes, tell me. On the Earth, on the Earth website, each national chapter has its own um right. you know, its own pages and you can and you can put in your own news items there and, and your oh, your Great. chapter will be seen by all of our members we have over six thousand members so yeah right. i think we need a website yes mm. yeah. okay so have a lovely meeting Thanks and a lot. enjoy <laughs> thanks so much for allowing me to be with you for some uh, minutes uh, great honor and pleasure Thanks a lot for your time, Your Excellency, and nice. We would love to have you another time with us <laughs> for more long. <laughs> bye bye. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. So uh, now we uh, are moving to our second talk uh, for today, which is with Dr. Tonya Plauser. Um, I hope that I spelled out your name correctly, Tonya. Uh, Tanya is the, the other LSD program coordinator and is responsible for the overall management of the fellowships, awards, and networking programs, as well as working with the, um, just a minute, please. I think there's someone trying to share his, her share, her uh, screen. Please pay attention that, to this, <laughs> sorry. So like, um, so Tanya is responsible for uh, overall management of the fellowships, awards, and networking programs, as well as working with the OWSD executive board to develop strategic plans, fundraise, and provide reports for OWSD members, uh, donors, and partners. Tanya has a PhD in women and gender, from the University of Warwick in the UK. She has a master in world literature in English from Marlboro University in the USA and BSc in sociology and social administration from Warwick in the UK as well. 
She has over 20 years experience as a teacher and writer, including as lecturer in English literature at Oxford Brookes University and at Royal Holloway College in the UK. Before running her own creative writing business in London, interesting, since 29, Tonya has developed science communication courses for PhD students in neuroscience, biology, physics, and mathematics. Before joining OWSD in 2013, Tonya was staff writer at WAS, editing the newsletter and website, and contributing many articles on science in developing countries. So we are welcoming Tonya. Tonya's speech will be um, divided into five sessions. I don't know. Tonya's speech will be divided into five sessions. Each of these sessions will represent the programs that Tonya is coordinating. After, if we, uh, uh, after each of these sessions, uh, we will open uh, for five minutes for QA a session for five minutes and there is like uh, the, f the first three ones are uh, moderated by Dr. Ilham Al Khatib. The last two are moderated by uh, Dr. Shahinaz Najjar. Please, for those who would love to uh, ask questions, write it in the chat and the moderator will summarize it and deliver it to Tonya. Tonya, the mic is yours. Well, thank you for that um, long and wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm just going to try and see if I can share my screen with you all. Yeah, definitely you can. Um, uh, okay. Can you see? Can you see? Not yet. No, yes. You can see? Okay. So if I go into, yes. into full screen mode. Uh, for some reason it's not going. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, Amiria, please let me know if you can't hear me for some reason or, <laughs> or anything. It's clear. Great. So it's so wonderful to, to have been invited. Thank you so much, Amira. Um, I have to congratulate you on, on some fantastic organization and your executive committee of the national chapter and really you've done a great deal in a very short amount of time um, is incredibly impressive. I think you now have, at least on our website, you have 83 members now, I think. Um, and I think maybe a year ago, you, you, you had three or four. So <laughs> you've done a fantastic job. Um, so what I wanted to do was, uh, I know it's very hard to follow presentations in this context of this virtual reality that we're living in at the moment. Um, so I thought the best thing was to have a PowerPoint so you can, you know, focus a little bit on some pictures and some text um, and to keep it uh, broken up into sessions so that you can ask questions around specific areas. So that way you won't get too confused. I think this is also being recorded so, you know, you don't have to worry about losing any information and I will share the, the PowerPoint with you as well. A lot of our information you can find by going onto our website. I don't know if any of you want to simultaneously look at the website while, I, while I'm talking, because that's another of the great things you can do with this virtual reality. Everybody is multitasking. Um, our website is www.owsd.net. Um, and we've got a huge amount of information there as well. So, and I'm happy for you to ask me questions about anything that you can't find there that you're looking for. Okay, so um, I don't really need to tell you the reasons why OSD exists, but I thought it's worth just giving you some, uh, a small background on that matter. Um, this is a wonderful website for uh, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, uh, UIS, and they put up, if you find this page, Women Researchers, Women in Science, you can go into different, um, for example, if I were to click on this, this is not a live link, but if I click on Arab States, it will go into each different country and it will start to uh, go deep down into how many researchers there are in different fields. It's a, it's a very good tool. Of course, the tools are only as good as the information they have. So this might be something that you could encourage your ministers to share uh, with UNESCO as much information as possible. But the, but the point is there are the numbers of women 
researchers uh, are, are very low globally, under under 30% in most places. Um, and you can see here, oops, sorry, this I've got a very sensitive um, <laughs> mouse, I'm not quite used to. Here you can see the different, um, for example, in Africa, Asia and the Pacific, in Africa, you can see the percentages of women researchers, most high in Tunisia, lowest in Chad, not surprisingly. Uh, in Asia, in the Pacific, sorry, this is going to be a problem. Um, very, very good numbers in Myanmar, nearly 86% in Myanmar. Uh, Palestine, I don't know if you can see that there, is one of the, in the lower end, 22.6% of uh, female researchers. This is not just in science, this is research in general. Um, and this, uh, this is a diagram that is often referred to as the scissors diagram. And it's a, it's a very good visual representation of what's going on. I think if any of you need to convince any uh, senior people about, why, about the situation for women in science, this is a good graph to choose. So what you can see is that at undergraduate level, the blue line is the female students. Uh, you can see that at an undergraduate level, there are more women coming in than men in most countries. This is, this is a kind of global average. And then as you go through the career, uh, research career to postgraduate, there is a dropping off point. And as you go through to more status, more uh, a higher stipend, more influence, more power, the number of women decreases. It would be good for you, I think, uh, maybe a task of the national chapter to chart your own uh, um, statistics against this general scissors chart. Um, so why is that important? Uh, well, first of all, you don't really want your labs to look like this, right? This is a 1960s black and white photo. Um, but I think you'll find that many labs still look pretty much like this. A lot of men in coats uh, doing their work, doing it extremely well, of course. But um, what happens when women are excluded? And not just women, but uh, our organization focuses on women specifically from developing countries. Well, one of the things that might happen is that um, because uh, people working tend to focus on issues that are pertinent to their own experience, right? We, we tend to look for problems and solve problems of things that we recognize that need doing. Now, if we don't have experience, um, if we don't have women involved, there's many areas of women's experience that might just get completely neglected. Uh, it's, um, and here, what you can see is a picture of uh, somebody practicing um, CPR on a patient and they're doing the kind of, you know, heart um, resuscitation technique. And it's well known now, I don't know if you've heard that actually the, well, the, the symptoms that they have um, defined for heart attacks actually were based on a male model of a heart attack and women's symptoms differ quite considerably from men's. And I know at least in my home country, the UK, there was a huge campaign um, some years ago where they showed a, a billboard poster of a man with his uh, chest all tightened and said, you know, if you're getting these symptoms, then go straight to A&E, go straight to accident and emergency. Women don't have the same symptoms. They don't, they don't feel that same uh, tightness of the chest. They don't have that classical left arm uh, numbness necessarily. And so what this translates in reality is that maybe women are not uh, going to the accident and emergency when they are actually experiencing a heart attack. And if uh, the information and dissemination of, in of information is changed, women's lives uh, would also be saved. That's one thing in terms of uh, diagnosis. Another is now we're moving towards artificial intelligence, robots, you may think, fantastic, they're going to be neutral. You don't have to worry about gender identity anymore. Um, but let's think carefully about what inventions uh, we have coming up and how they might still reflect gender um, dichotomy. So, for example, here you've got a neutral robot uh, hoovering in the lounge. Now, somebody has to program that robot. That robot will also have a body 
that is decided that will mimic, uh, has to look like a human body. The size, the dimensions of that body uh, could be so kind of mutual, but they will tend to reflect the inventor in many ways, unless there are interventions to make sure that um, neutrality is, is, is maintained as much as possible. If the robot speaks, uh, will they speak with a male voice or a female voice? If this, is a, if this is a cook robot or a house cleaning robot, you know, these things are important. And depending on those decisions, it may well be that how we interact with that robot, even though that robot has no sex whatsoever, it's gender neutral. If they have a female voice, maybe we will reproduce the dynamics of gender to that female robot. Maybe we will talk down to that robot. We will uh, command the robot in a specific way. So these are all things to bear in mind. And if they're not raised uh, during the research design process, then we will go very far down the line, um, actually uh, reproducing uh, gender stereotypes rather than transforming them, which is what we have an opportunity to do in the current climate. Um, so that's the reason why it's very important to have women involved in the, in the design of research and the implementation of research again. Um, here I have a slide which is just sort of looking at um, different kind of disease diseases. And again, this is mentioning why it's important to involve, to include, to bring to the table at any point um, scientists from the developing world who often are excluded from, from many uh, discussions and whose contributions, um, for example, in the, in the present pandemic, uh, so much experience of Ebola uh, in, in Western Africa that uh, could actually have been incredibly pertinent to how we designed uh, mitigating strategies for example, especially where I live now in Italy, we had, a, we, as you all know, I'm sure we were one of the first hit, um, but we didn't have that experience behind us. And many African countries, it seems, are, are responding very well uh, to the pandemic because they have that experience behind them. Um, again, here, I don't know if any of you, I don't know what the situation is like uh, in Palestine, but this is a Kenyan uh, invention of uh, using the mobile phone for banking kind of, uh, it's called M-Pesa, you can see the poster in the background there. Um, and this has transformed how, how people can operate in Kenya and it's being rolled out in other African countries too. This is when the needs uh, can be responded to by researchers, by designers, by innovators. That's why it's so, so important to have as big a representation of the diversity of your country as possible, then real solutions will be found to real problems. And it also affects the implementation, right? Because, uh, for example, uh, many women um, in developing countries work in agriculture. They're kind of on the, on the front line of agriculture. They prepare the food uh, for their countries. If they are not uh, involved in the design of solutions to improve agriculture, if all of the design solutions depend on huge farms, uh, major big machinery that the women themselves will not be able to operate, then that's a failed product. It's a failed investment. Um, so that's just really to give you uh, a background to why we believe it's fundamentally important to invest uh, and support uh, women scientists from developing countries. And this, uh, this portrait here is of a man you may have heard of. His name is Abdus Salam from Pakistan who actually over 50 years ago set up the campus where OZT uh, International operates, where we have lived for over 26 years now. Um, and Abdul Salam was a, a genius and a theoretical physicist uh, living in Pakistan, um, who had a dream that um, he, he found it extremely difficult to continue his research at high level when he returned to Pakistan after going to Cambridge University. Um, and he wanted to create a, an environment where visiting scientists from developing countries could come and uh, he managed to establish this institute in Trieste for a series of reasons, uh, incidental reasons, but we're very happy <laughs> that he did so. Um, and uh, ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics, hosts over uh, 600 scientists come and stay and work in, uh, at the ICTP every year. 
Uh, they have access to all the resources of the what used to be very important, the ICTB library. They network with many other scientists. They get a break from their intense teaching. Um, and this is a kind of a way for them to top up their academic research, but still uh, uh, live and work in their home countries and continue to contribute. So this is an important uh, uh, motivation behind also the work that OZ does. Um, here you can see this is me here and Tabasum Mumtaz is uh, also on the call. I saw this is Tabasum here. Hi Tabasum. <laughs> um, this is the Bangladesh, Bangladesh national chapter, um, sorry, where I, I visited last year and um, they had a fantastic launch, uh, relaunch party and they're doing some wonderful activities. This was for the 25th anniversary. Um, and also to celebrate our 25th anniversary, we invited OZD uh, members from around the world to uh, send in their videos of what OZD has meant to them. And you can find all of these lovely videos on our website. So that's just a, a brief introduction to the background of OZD. Um, I could stop briefly there, uh, Amira, for questions, or I could go into the programs. You let me know. Uh, actually, from now on, uh, Dr. Ilham will be uh, uh, monitoring these sessions. So the decisions to her. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you, Tonya. I think because we are behind and many of uh, our uh, lady researchers are in different time zones, and I think we need to proceed to uh, the next session. Then we will have questions on both sessions. Okay anyone uh, who uh, has a question to put it in the uh, chat uh, uh, and I will write it down and we will ask it at the end of the session. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you a lot. Perfect. And please uh, do stop me if I'm going too fast or too slow even. Uh, let me know. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so we've, we've, there are four main ways in which OZD uh, supports women uh, in science from developing countries. They can be thought of as community, mobility, stability, and visibility. The first is community, which is what you are all about, the OZD Palestine National Chapter. Um, so an OZD member is a woman who has, uh, a full member, sorry, is a woman who has at least a master's or a PhD in a science subject, including social science, uh, and uh, is living or working in a developing country. Um, this, uh, this number here of the membership is, is changing quite radically right now because we, you may, I hope you've received uh, information about this. We've just done a big database cleanup. So we've had women on our books since, you know, 26, 27, 28 years ago. Um, and we're just wanting to make sure that really the members that we have on board are active members that we can contact via email. Uh, so it's really a meaningful number. That number now looks, after we've done this cleanup, just now finished a, a week or so ago, looks more like it will be around 6,000 members by the end of the year. It's over 5,000 right now. So it's a very, very healthy number of very active uh, women members. You can see that Africa, we have approximately half of our members are in Africa. Asia and Pacific, a quarter of our members in the Arab region, less 14%, uh, and the, the smallest number in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's for historic reasons in many ways, because uh, most of our funded programs have been focused on uh, least developed countries. And as you know, uh, most of those are actually in Africa. But uh, the membership is really, really go growing right now. It's been fantastic and the Palestinian National Chapter is really evidence of this. Uh, over the last year, 2019, we got nearly 1,800 new members. Now that's a huge number. If you think that now our, our, mem our active membership total is just over 5,000, that's really a huge number in the last year. So just want to really confirm that we're, we're a, even though we're a well-established organization, we're also very, young emerging uh, dynamic organization last year in last year alone 2019 10 new national chapters uh, 28 active national chapters in total that's already increased i think now to about 32 uh, just recently most recent one in guatemala and brazil have just been confirmed 
Um, and these national chapters have been organizing a huge amount of activities of which we've counted 44 in 2019. And I'll give you some examples of those activities. Uh, and you can just see, um, sorry, I'm just moving my icons off so my graph, can't see, but <laughs> um, the membership growth up until 2019 in the last uh, you know, four years, really, that growth has really accelerated and in the Arab region is also growing. So if there are more than 20 members in any one country, the members can decide to set up what we call a national chapter. And that's exactly what Amira did when she, uh, she uh, got to know us through the uh, Oz del Sevier Foundation Awards. Congratulations, Amira, where we met together uh, in Boston, Amira. Washington, sorry, <laughs> in Washington, that's right. Washington, yeah. It changes the uh, changes city every year, and we were in Washington together. And um, and Amira then did a huge amount of work getting more and more members on board. Uh, if there are at least 20 members on board, you set up your national national chapter. Here you, and then the national chapters uh, appear on our website. And you can see a snapshot here, for example, sorry, uh, of... Uh, and you can go to our website and you can look down. For example, in Malawi, you can see in that small snapshot there, we have 37 members, one of whom ha is currently undergoing our PhD uh, fellowship, four who have graduated with our PhD program, and one who has now currently got an early career fellowship with us. In Zambia, we have 36 members, three PhD fellows and four PhD graduates. Now, these are, these are some of the, the poorest countries and um, it's remarkable that we have so much uh, interest, commitment and activity happening in these countries. Um, once you, the national chapter is established, you will have this page on our website and uh, a page is, uh, is already there for Palestine in our website and we hope that you will soon populate it with pictures of your executive committee. You have your wonderful logo, which I've, I've got a bit further on. Um, and uh, we will post, if you send us uh, news items, apart from the fact that they will be published on your own national chapter uh, page, many of those will be uh, looked at by us and posted on our home page, our front page of our website. And we will also in turn write news items about your activities and publicize as much as we can uh, what's going on to all of our members. Um, the launches, which uh, you're looking forward to, and I do hope that you're able to do something really exciting, if not this year, next year, and it looks as though you've got such wonderful support from your minister. Here we have Minister of uh, Gender um, in uh, Rwanda, who is also very much on board with the Roma Rwanda National Chapter. Uh, during the launch with our president, Jennifer Thompson here, I was present at this, uh, this launch, and the Rwanda indeed introduced the, what's now become a long-standing tradition of the cake, which uh, has the, every, every chapter interprets how they wish, but has the O's logo on it. And, um, and then there's an occasion for cutting the cake with the representative, hopefully, of the O's executive board, whether the president or the regional representative. Huda Basalim is your regional representative and also um, Nashwa Issa from Sudan. I'm sure either of them would be delighted to attend a, a launch ceremony. I would also love to come if it's at all feasible. <laughs> um, just to give you another idea of the activities, this uh, Sudan uh, have been incredibly creative and very uh, thoughtful about the activities. Here they had a campaign among the universities where they got um, members of the chapter to go around all of these different universities that you can see here introducing O's to the um, uh, to graduates and undergraduates, uh, women uh, scientists at the university, explaining all about O's and why they might want to participate. Um, that I think is a, is a fabulous, fabulous uh, possibility for us. And we hope that you could do something similar and perhaps introduce our fellowship programs uh, to members as you go around the country. Uh, finally, the final uh, part of this, uh, this uh, introductory uh, talk about the membership is uh, the members have the right to vote uh, for the executive board, uh, our O's executive board. We have eight members of the executive board plus the president, so nine in total, um, two from each region. And Huda Basalim, who is on this call, is our regional member for uh, the Arab region and was also present, was elected in 2016 in Kuwait at this, uh, at this 
wonderful ceremony. Many dignitaries were present. Um, and over 300 uh, women participants from all over the world, but a huge uh, number also locally from Kuwait and from the Arab region. And is a great networking opportunity and many scientific presentations are made and lots of uh, uh, news in the region generated from this event. Okay, so that's my first part, Amira, <laughs> if you have any questions. Okay, uh, so thank you, Tonya. That was uh, very great. Uh, you gave us like lots of, even of ideas. We've been meeting uh, in the past period, thinking of our next uh, activities. And actually this is uh, our second activity because we already arranged for uh, a nice, uh, we uh, hosted uh, an expert and uh, we invited all the chapter and other researchers uh, from Palestine from, and from all uh, the Arab world uh, to uh, an open, uh, and had a lecture on open, in, in open access uh, publishing. Uh, and we got like very, very good audience. So we were thinking, and you gave us like lots of uh, very uh, good ideas, um, uh, like uh, the info sessions. Maybe in Palestine, it's not like Sudan. Maybe we don't need to go to tour. Maybe we can invite, but also we can do like small tours to the north, to the south, yeah, to market the idea and the programs uh, of this uh, great organization. Um, do you, anybody have? Any question to Tonya about membership, chapters, uh, anything? After that, we will move, I think, which is something interesting to all of you, to the specific awards. Do you have any questions about uh, uh, what has been said so far? I have, I, have, I have a question, sorry. Yes, please, Ala, go ahead. So, um, so I'm also new to the OS, OWSD. Um, this year I participated like a full member. Um, I have um, the situation that, uh, so I live in Palestine, but um, I work remotely with the um, university in Stuttgart, the University of Stuttgart in, in Germany. So, um, so I wanted to ask, uh, because I, I noticed that most of the applications for fellowship or um, any kind of programs, uh, the the member should be a uh, part of a university, like uh, working. Ah, okay, at Allah. So you want a uh, like it's how we, uh, uh, you know, like uh, identify uh, this yeah. Uh, yeah. research according to their residence or to their work. And yeah. one example, uh, like it's usually it is you know figured out. We work and live in the same country, but we have some exceptions, like Allah. Yeah. She lives in Palestine and she works remotely with a German university. So what do you think, Tonya? Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that alongside the fellowship. Um, okay. The yes. fellowship. Yes. Because I, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So we will move. But before that, as we discussed with Dr. Marwan, I think one of the great things that we can do ahead and um, that we can have a support from OWSD uh, is two things, I think. Uh, first, to connect us more uh, with uh, the other chapters so we can, you know, um, you know, share our activities. So maybe we can go like Jordan. It's an easy trip when they open the borders. So we can go there and even other countries uh, or they uh, come to us. We will talk about this, about uh, the mobility in Palestine and the movement, maybe also in the next session because we have a problem with that and maybe the OWSD can help us uh, in this, in the free of movement and the visa thing. But uh, having, uh, you know, uh, or sharing the activities and you can guide us what we can do. Like you suggested a website and I think, uh, I remember that we discussed this in our meetings and we are working on a website uh, how we can use website to share other websites, our links with other web, uh, chapters and the other chapters will share our websites so we can, you know, share our activities. This one thing, and if you have any other hints and tips that we can do as a chapter, so we can 
uh, you know, uh, know more about and interconnect with other chapters, I think this will be very, very great. This is one. The second one is regional workshops. I think we need uh, in this area, like uh, regional workshop, we, as we can connect, you know, from different uh, countries in the region. So it will be like uh, networking, connecting and learning together. I think this will be very, very good. We can have the support from our countries, from uh, external funding, from other organizations. We can all work towards that, but I think we need this umbrella to bring us together. Yes, thank you. Um, there, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there. S certainly we can, we can also give you some very, very concrete uh, ideas uh, what, what other chapters have done. We, we've got, we kind of got yes. a, a list of all of those things and you can also on our website, if you go to the news items uh, on the national chapters, you'll see that we're always celebrating different activities that they, mm -hmm. they do. But one of the things that um, seems to be very productive is that in initial meetings, I think uh, national chapters take care to try and um, get some feedback from the members in the country about what the specific challenges are and mm -hmm. what, what is it that, that you need what would you like? What do you need? And how can you go about, uh, you know, solving some of the challenges that you face? And sometimes it's just actually, sometimes it's, I mean, it's not enough, but it, it, it is definitely something just to share challenges together can be really, really important for women in, in many situations. You know, the, the double burden of housework and childcare and how it might stop you uh, getting ahead in your career and you don't have the time for the research, particularly now that we're teleworking, that's obviously emphasized quite a lot for, for women. And then people can also share their best practices and say, well, you know, this was my situation and I managed to then, you know, get together with another woman who was having the same problem. You know, lots of those kinds of sharing uh, opportunities are incredibly important and they don't really cost money. Those are things that you can do. Um, uh, we we owes to international we don't actually at the moment have uh, any kind of direct funds available for national chapters but what we have been able to do over the last couple of years is kind of use some money that we have indirectly so if the national chapters host um any any kind of workshops that would include our phd fellows for example then we can um give some funding because our funding at the moment is all towards our our fellows um, we had some specific funding for our 25th anniversary, and so they were, we were able to, uh, you know, give a, a little bit of money for national chapter launches. We may be able, but that's really, we're not talking, you know, very much money. So really the emphasis is on uh, the national chapters doing your own fundraising. Um, but I think you'll find that being attached to a, a big international organization makes that easier. And we, again, we can, we can really try and help you in that. Uh, Another thing that many national chapters are doing, which is fantastic because it's what we, we don't cover this in our own uh, programs, is going out to schools um, and, you know, just talking to young students who might be thinking about science or going to university, they, they find that incredibly useful and seeing the role models, you know, women who are physicists or mathematicians or biologists going into schools and saying, look, this is my job. It's fantastic, you know. Uh, why don't you do it too? Well, this is so just giving some real kind of live information. But there's a whole bunch of things that people are doing. Uh, workshops, science communication workshops. We can connect you with good trainers. You know, we can give you some advice and some support, some support on those kind of things. Possibly web webinars, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of lot of help and support from the secretariat. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. There's a question, and then we'll move. A uh, high is a master of science and strategic marketing from Reputual University considered as one of your criteria for membership acceptance, taking into consideration that my research focus is on women entrepreneurship. Sorry, the question is this is for membership or for this is for membership? Yeah. Okay, so um, you can find an extended uh, eligibility criteria for the, the, the subjects, but basically science and social science. So entrepreneur is, uh, is, is included there, I think. Okay. So Asmahania, I, you can apply. Okay, perfect. Now, 
we will move to the, our second session. Okay. About fellowship, please. So, uh, so the first important uh, support was community. Without the community, we can't really do much. Uh, it's word of mouth. You are the ones who get our programs out there so that people apply for them. Mobility is the notion that uh, because of the nature of uh, the countries that we work with, um, they tend to be lacking in, in some of the basic scientific uh, and technological infrastructure. Now, uh, that's not necessarily because of lack of will. I think your minister has shown a huge goodwill and uh, desire to invest in, in science. Uh, it's about resources, not having those resources. Um, and so by definition, by default, uh, women from the countries that we work with, in order to get uh, a good level PhD, they actually need to leave their home countries. They can't get that level where they are. Um, so we fund women to move, but we, but it's a south to south program. So that means that uh, we don't fund uh, women scientists to go and do their, their degrees in Europe or North America. Um, and, you know, some of you may find that that's a, a bit unfortunate, but um, the reason behind it is that we have limited funds. We, we, we give up to 40 fellowships per year. The cost of the fellowships in uh, in Europe and uh, America is sometimes, you know, ten times as much as it is uh, in developing countries. There are incredibly good institutes in developing countries in the South of very high quality. But it's not just that as well. There's also the the um, the movement is it, it tends to be regional and therefore less of a culture shock, less of a less of a huge uh, um, journey, if you like. And um, so, so we have these South to South programs. Um, the, Sweden has been funding uh, these PhD fellowships since 1998, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. They had a focus on least developed countries uh, and that's also extended now to scientifically and technologically lagging countries. Um, any uh, PhD in the natural sciences. So here we don't actually fund PhDs in social sciences at the moment. The eligible countries, you can see, uh, so Palestine was actually added to our list only a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and we're delighted uh, to have you on board. There are a few uh, countries in the Arab uh, world that are eligible for our um, fellowships. However, many, many countries in the Arab world would obviously be eligible to be host institutes. But just to give you an idea of the movement where people go in 2019, uh, on the left hand side there, you can see the countries where the host institutes were. And along the bottom, you can see uh, where the, uh, the PhD fellows came from. So on the bottom line there, you can see most of our fellows actually went to South Africa from other countries in Africa. So two from Kenya, uh, three from Uganda, Camer and then you've got two from Cameroon, um, Benin, and then also from Zimbabwe, Sudan, Senegal, Lesotho, and Ghana. Um, in the only uh, Arab host we have had in 2019 is in Morocco, hosting somebody from uh, Mauritania. Um, you can see there's a lot of, uh, lot of room for development. Um, we would be, we, we usually have actually many uh, PhD fellows from Sudan. Last year was uh, an exception. We only had one student from Sudan. Um, so what do we provide in this fellowship then? Uh, it's a monthly stipend. It's a modest stipend uh, to cover uh, food and lodging. Uh, one return trip over the whole of the four year fellowship period for a full time PhD. Um, plus the visa and medical insurance, an additional travel grant of up to between $3,000 and $4,000 usually for the fellow to travel to international conferences. And here the conferences can be anywhere in the world. So that's a good opportunity to use that money to travel to Europe, to travel to the States for these, you know, prestigious international workshops and conferences. Uh, funding from CEDA to attend a regional workshop 
and uh, to attend the OST General Assembly. This is if you are a, a fellowship, a PhD fellowship holder. We ask host institutes to provide tuition fees, registration fees and bench fees. That doesn't always happen, but we encourage host institutes to do that. Additionally, the host institutes may provide orientation workshops, science communication workshops, English language training and career development opportunities. Um, we've got over 280 fellows who graduated through the OST PhD fellowship scheme, and that's a pretty impressive number. And we are in touch with many, many of our alumni and continue to offer them opportunities and resources. <clears throat> uh, the disciplines, excuse me, my voice is going. <clears throat> the um, <coughs> Discipline trend is interesting. <coughs> You're probably aware that um, there are underrepresented fields for women, uh, which tend to be physics, mathematics, uh, engineering. Um, and in fact, from 2012 to 2016, for example, there were only 2% of the women scientists in astronomy. Now that's gone up to 6%. 5% in engineering has gone up to 12%. Chemical sciences is, is pretty good representation. Physics actually has decreased from 9% to 6%. Mathematical sciences stays pretty even around 4% or 3%. Um, we have good numbers in medical and health, and most of our awardees actually are in agriculture, over a third. Computing and information technology, again, very low representation and a good representation in, in, in structural biology and biological systems. Uh, I mentioned the conference support, which um, is the opportunity while you're doing the PhD fellowship with us, for example, here we have a young woman from uh, Kenya who traveled to Singapore um, to attend a, a conference on virology, actually. So that just gives us an idea of the PhD fellowship program and I welcome any questions or clarifications. Okay, uh, thank you again for this uh, informative uh, section. So maybe we can now answer um, a, la, a question about uh, eligibility to apply if you are living in one country and represent uh, working in another country. So my question to Ala would be, uh, what what would the funds be? What what would the funds be required for? Okay, Ala, are you with us? In fact, um, there was an application in the beginning of the year for uh, for a project um, to to suggest a project and get funding for. And my idea was, I hope. What's, I the, name? Could... What's the name of the fellowship so she can help you? Because I think every. Uh, um, has its own eligibility. If you if you want to take time, I will go to other questions. Look for the name of the fellowship that you are interested in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that I can say straight away that we don't we don't you know we we only have our own fellowship. We don't um, we can't offer any opportunities through other fellowships. Um, mm -hmm. the, the this the funding is kind of activated. For the purposes of mo mobility at the PhD level, that's the that's the point of the funds. Uh, we don't. Uh, have in fact, I already have PhD. I mean, I'm not planning on. Do, but like visiting, uh, visiting, um, like to make to to visit other universities. I'm not from a university here, but um, to have um, like like yeah. a couple of months visit to another university for research. That so. Oh, that we don't have those opportunities, but you could have a look on the on our partner uh, organization's website. So that's the World Academy of Sciences. I don't know if you've heard of them, TWAS, and they have TWAS.org, mm -hmm. and they have opportunities for men as well from developing countries, and they have exchange programs, so kind of short-term visits as well. Um, mm -hmm. I can follow up with that. I can send you a link uh, afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot. So yeah, so there will be other uh, opportunities from partner uh, uh, organization. Any other question on this specific fellowship? 
Fatima Al Fakih. Uh, okay. I'm Dr. Fatima Al Fakih from uh, Palestine Technical University, Ramallah branch. Uh, thank you, Tonya. Thank you, everyone, to be a member and uh, one of uh, this incredible uh, statue. Uh, I want to ask about you talk about uh, the full uh, PhD ship and uh, uh, everything. I want to ask about the uh, postdoc. Is there uh, a full ship for a postdoc? Uh, and okay. okay. In any universities? In universities in Europe or in any university, and um, today, and uh, we have a very uh, uh, famous science. We don't know a lot of them. We have exercise physiologies. We have uh, you uh, put it in humanity, and uh, I think uh, we don't take the. Uh, right way to raise this uh, specialist uh, in this uh, area. فاطمة معلش أنا ما فهمتك تحكي لي بالعربي آخر جملة خليني إنه إحنا في عنا هلا العلم المتحضر الجديد إنه العلم فيسيولوجيا الجهد البدني والرياضة يعني فيسيولوجيا الجهد البدني. والإكسيرسايز إنه منطغي على العالم برتعيت إنه كثير في شغلات يعني Okay, so Tanya, yeah, so the two questions, I think the first one which is Postdoc Postdoc I think you will speak about it in the next session and the second thing, if you have any opportunities for career advancement in physical education and in uh, exercise, uh, which like Fatma. Exercise physiology, yeah. Yeah, exercise physiology, that it's very important now. Yeah. Realizing the importance of exercise for immunology and what's happening uh, in the world. So do you have any comments on that, Tonya? Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the for the questions. I, we, we don't, I'll just briefly answer the first question. I will, I will be talking about um, fellowships at postdoc. They are after the PhD, but uh, they're not the typical postdoc awards, and in fact, uh, you know that kind of that kind of bridge between finishing a PhD and going on to a, a large grant award. We don't yet have anything in that area. We're working towards trying to get some specific funding for for postdoc activities. But so the short answer to that is 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 no, we don't. But we do have this early career fellowship that I will explain to you in a in a bit. Um, yeah, I think I wanted to also say that um, I, I, I forgot to mention, and it's very important, we do also offer a part-time, it's called a sandwich program at PhD level, which means that you can be based in Palestine and go for up to three trips to another institute in, in another country uh, for at least six months. So uh, that allows some flexibility while staying also in, in Palestine. And you're funded every time you you visit basically. Um, sorry, I think there was another question that I've about exercise for uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, I I think that that would be included as a as a science uh, field, and in fact, the very the extended full list of eligible disciplines is now available on the website. And again, I'll I'll send you the link to that, but you can you should be able to find it when you look up eligibility underneath the PhD fellowship scheme. You should be able to see. Okay. So, Tonya, when you talked about the sandwich technique, that means that you are affiliated with an institution in your country and you go for a research visits, or it is you're affiliated with an institution in another country, but you do it from home and you just go for on-campus visits like a three times a year. So, actually, you, you receive the PhD from the... Um, from the country that you're visiting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you you can go, so for example, if you're based at the at Ramallah Branch University in Palestine, mm -hmm. you may decide that in the second year, you would mm -hmm. like to go to, um, I don't know, a university in Morocco for six months mm -hmm. in order to 
carry out some very specific work in a laboratory there that has resources that you don't have in your in your own laboratory uh, mm -hmm. and you could go and work with a with an identified supervisor your home supervisor would you know also you know, work hopefully collaborate well with this other supervisor at the um, uh, and then you would write a report on that you would then be able to return for up to another two visits okay but then my, my certificate will be from ramallah branch university this I, i'm sorry i have to just double check this um yeah, I you, sometimes, that, yeah. sometimes it, the, it, because it, some countries the Home Institute can't actually award the PhD, so there's a there's a kind of a joint award. Oh, uh, uh, it's joint uh, degree, because there's some some PhD degrees that it's allowable not to be on campus all the time. So, like I, I know Sudan and others, so you can stay at home, work in your work, and just do some uh, visits to the country that grants you the degree. Oh, I see. So what you're saying is that you would be based in this example, you'd be based in Palestine, but you'd be fully enrolled in Sudan, but you wouldn't always be in Sudan. Yes. This is one kind of what's happening here. So are those people for this grant? Well, this is a very interesting issue that has not been raised as far as I know before, and it might be quite specific to Palestine, Palestine right now. But um, as I said, uh -huh. The, the, the kind of uh, the emphasis for for us historically has always been that the funding is for the travel so this okay. is absolutely possible but then you you wouldn't be funded when you were at home at home okay so my other question that now we are in Palestine have uh, I know that we are aware on the on the website for to be eligible for Palestinian scholars to apply for PhD but what about having people from abroad? Or from other countries to have their PhDs here in Palestine because we already absolutely absolutely we would we would love that and we would love that and it would be great to you have such a supportive minister I mean I would be really really happy to you know talk further with him about that possibility because I think um, we you know we have we have uh, we have actually even least developed countries that have hosted uh, have hosted um, yeah. students and what we have is we, we we need evidence that you know that the the research carried out is of a, a high quality that the supervisor is engaged in the in the topic that the resources are enough and that the, the student would be getting more than they would be getting at their home institute obviously um, and then we would enter into a kind of memorandum of understanding with the host institute and uh, you know, we set out what our expectations are in the agreement and and what the host you can expect from us mm -hmm. um, but, but absolutely we, we encourage and we would love I mean I, I think with for Palestine we, we perhaps need to have some more conversations to understand I think you know as the, the minister, visa thing yeah mm -hmm. the visa issue and um, you know how who, who could you realistically host I mean mm -hmm. that would be very interesting for us to know I mean for example could you host Ye uh, visitors from Yemen for example okay there's, no. there's like straightforward countries that we can host, but there are other countries I think we need more complicated uh, procedures to do. And maybe we'll try how this, like being framed under this program can help us maybe. So maybe yeah. we'll talk about that, yes. I mean, I really, really hope that being associated with those may may help you to kind of in some way, you know, start, start, start moving again. <laughs> yeah, opening for the other, like, opening for the world, that, that would be great. If, if, if there is uh, somebody from one of our eligible countries who would like to study in Palestine and can manage the visa, then we have absolutely no reason. Yeah, not this to. would be like a straightforward, okay, to, uh, you know, like way to do it. Perfect. Yeah. We um, would that. And I should, I should say also that we, we have, a, we have a, a, a rigorous selection process. So uh, oh. We uh, traditionally we've met in uh, in Trieste with uh, experts who work in developing countries who are well informed about science in developing countries on the on the panel and we've met in person. Obviously this year we're not meeting in person. Amira, I think you've been invited to participate in the uh, in the selection committee. Really, I received I, nothing. <laughs> ah, no. well. Any, uh, uh, maybe it's because it, yeah, maybe it's because it's too recent for you. Yeah. 
yeah. Okay. But so, so we have, so yeah. But but now we're able to do we, even the selection committee. You know, is obviously being done online this year. So um, perfect. Okay. So we will talk about this. I hope like Ayman is with us. He's like uh, the executive uh, uh, in no, no. that he can. <laughs> Uh, Ayman, you can uh, maybe uh, talk to Dr. Awartani about that, about like talking with OSD, OWSD, about hosting PhD and, uh, you know, initiating this uh, MOU. So now I think it's time uh, to move to our uh, third uh, or fourth session. And I will give a microphone now to Dr. Shahnaz that will uh, chair the next uh, session. I think now, uh, Tonya, you can start with the next session, then uh, Dr. Shahnaz will uh, chair the QA uh, session. Thank you very much, Tonya, for all the beautiful information that you gave us so far. You're very, very welcome, and I really hope it's clear enough. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to take on board, um, but it's very interesting, all of these questions, too. So uh, this part of the program I've called stability, but it could also be called with a more uh, obvious uh, name that you've probably heard a lot used, especially with international organizations of capacity building. So for me, I like, the, I like the word stability. I also like the idea of turning on its head the notion that um, women sometimes should stay at home. <laughs> that sometimes it could be of benefit for everybody uh, if women were able to uh, stay in their home countries and their home institutes to carry out their scientific research at a high level. So the, this you can see on my slide here, it gives you the details of what the grant uh, is made up of. But before I, I, I tell you that, I want to just tell you what the vision for the, for the fellowship is. It, it's a very prestigious grant. It's $50,000 for a two year fellowship. Uh, the fellowship is generously given by the Canadian International Development Research Center, who work very closely with us also in establishing the details of the program. Um, they had a, a keen interest in linking with industry, which I'll say a bit more about in a, in a minute. But the idea behind this, which we worked a lot to develop together, and it's a, in some ways it's a unique program, the idea is that, and I hope that many of you will relate to this scenario, <clears throat> that by definition, you've gone abroad to get your PhD, you've had an amazing experience, um, wonderful networking, great resources, uh, you know, you're at the height of your career, you come back home and you find yourself often in, ex in a similar situation to when you left. You've changed, but your institute hasn't. <laughs> There are still no resources, you don't have international contacts. Um, and in addition, you're in great demand as a teacher. You may have hundreds of students, so the time that you can devote to research is less. You're in great demand as somebody who's been successful, so you may be required to sit on committees and, and lots of things. This may be a crucial moment when you would drop out. All of this investment, you've had investment in your PhD, you might get back and then you think, I can't keep this up at this level, at research level. Um, so this is an opportunity really to, uh, with a very flexible grant to say, okay, you write your proposal and you tell us what you need to continue your research at the highest level. What can we bring to you? So one of the key things will be, if you're working in, in you know, sort of practical natural sciences, Often it's equipment and setting up a laboratory to adequate levels. Uh, that may include also the technician that you need. It may include MSc students that need to work in the lab. Uh, specific equipment that could be used not just by your students, but also other people in the university. So it's a, an additional benefit to the, to the university that you work in. Um, you might feel that you need uh, specific training in leadership, how to manage a, a team, how to, how to work with uh, a research team. The idea is that you will, as a, as a woman, a, a relatively young woman who is doing exceedingly well in her science, you will become a focal point in your university. You will start to set up a kind of research team around you and people from other countries will want to come and work in your lab and work with your team rather than you having to always go elsewhere. Um, and there's the idea of linking with industry is whenever it's possible. I mean, we understand that for some subjects like maths in particular, 
it might be very difficult to link with industry or have anything relevant to do with industry. But the idea is that once our funding leaves, you need to ha have a way of sustaining at a high level the, 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 the funding coming in. And one way to do that is to develop prototypes, uh, get patents, uh, get private uh, corporations to back you. Um, so all of these things are, are very important. In order to do this well, you need some training also provided by the O Secretariat. And we run two workshops during these two years. The first workshop is uh, based in Trieste. It's a kind of orientation workshop where we go through the grant process. We, we, we help you with the challenges that you face. Um, and then the second one uh, is more focused around this linking up with industry and will be held in, uh, in the regions. This is one place where uh, I don't know if uh, Professor Ayman is taking note here, but the, the minister could, uh, could uh, you know, hosting one of these workshops for the early career or, or indeed for the PhD fellows is, is something that we're very interested in, in, in finding partners for. Um, this was the, one of the workshops in Trieste with the early career fellows. Uh, these are the certificates at the end of their week long training workshop. Um, here is Luc Mougeot, we work very closely with from Canada, um, and you can see all the participants from different uh, places. This is just to give you an example here of the international links that go on. So this is equipment from the, the early career fellows. You can see the, the, the cunt, oops, sorry, gone ahead here. Oh. Um, you can see that, for example, uh, the awardee here from Bangladesh is, uh, has ordered a piece of equipment from Bangladesh, so a kind of local company. You can see uh, an awardee from Cameroon has also ordered equipment from Cameroon. But then you can see something from Cameroon is ordered from China, something from Uganda ordered from China, from Congo, from France, Bangladesh ordered from Germany, Ethiopia ordered from Italy, Tanzania also from Italy. So, and Sri Lanka, lots of, uh, Sri Lanka has, has good industrial uh, resources. And so many of the, much of the equipment is ordered within the country. Um, from Ethiopia, the bottom one there, ordering from the United Arab Emirates, for example. So, uh, that's a, that's a big part of this grant is understanding the procurement process, how to go about ordering and securing the best, uh, the best rate, the best price for the equipment, who provides it, you know, all the delivery services, which can be quite tricky with the, you know, shipment and uh, um, entry issues. Here we here it's very nice that somebody put the O's label on their piece of equipment in the lab, <laughs> just to show that we it's been provided by O's. Um, and I just wanted to give you a, a brief idea of what some of the um, the early career fellows are doing. So um, here we have uh, our wonderful uh, fellow from Tanzania who's working in uh, the. Uh, in, in, in kind of re, sort of recycling the, the, the waste from garm, the garment industry using a sophisticated kind of nanotechnology uh, to uh, make sure that the, 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 the garments disintegrate and are non-toxic. Um, so very interesting work that she's doing. Um, we held our regional workshop for the early career fellows in Tanzania last November because three of our fellows were from Tanzania and they volunteered to host that workshop. And it was hosted by the O's Tanzania National Chapter. So there's a lot of, you know, things coming together there. Um, here you can see, as I had explained to you before, the, the lovely cake used in the launch of the National Chapter with the the Cameroon uh, National Chapter logo. Somebody from Cameroon attended the um, early career workshop in Tanzania and then took all of the knowledge that she'd learned from that launch back to the launch of the National Chapter in Cameroon. So there's a lot of cross fertilizing. I think you were talking about this earlier, how you know to get lots of regional contact and movement. Um, and here you can see all the lovely logos that have been developed uh, by all the different O's, the national chapters, and your lovely 
owes the Palestine National Chapter here uh, alongside all of these others that you can see. That, so that's the early career fellowship. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm charging through here, but <laughs> it's perhaps easier to concentrate if you have specific questions. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Tonya, for your uh, presentation. Uh, we are so happy to see our uh, national, Palestinian national chapter logo here. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I don't see any question from uh, our uh, attendees, but um, I think you presented uh, the challenges we faced after finishing uh, our PhD, when we, because most of us, we did uh, our uh, PhD uh, abroad and you describe the situation really very well as it is as we experience in our life, um, uh, having work very demanding on giving lectures, uh, uh, being involved in administrative work. So uh, giving the opportunity uh, to uh, have a, a sort of uh, research and, and, and uh, doing research after uh, like a postdoc, this is really, Great, and I think uh, we all uh, can uh, benefit from uh, this opportunity. What I really uh, liked, uh, and um, uh, it's about the, the, the two workshops that you uh, mentioned, uh, the strengthening the leadership and collaborating with the in industry, which uh, uh, I think uh, we can um, we can uh, benefit from these two uh, workshops a lot, as well as the postdoctoral proposals, which um, uh, yeah, we, can, uh, uh, we can really uh, use it and, and, and benefit from it. But um, I, would, I would hear from you uh, more about how could you support and, and, and follow up the um, sustainability of the project I mean, uh, after for let's say about uh, post for post doctor doctoral uh, um, uh, scholarships, uh, how could you uh, support and follow follow up to keep sustainability of the project? Well, that's an excellent question, and if we knew the answer, I think we would be out of business. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, the, the Early Career Fellowship is, is a brand new program. We just, uh, we're just now, we, the, the call for applications has closed and we're now selecting uh, the new, the third cohort. So there's 20 fellows selected each year. We've got 40 already and we'll, we'll have another 20. Um, 24th of June is when we're doing the selection committee for the Early Career. So it's a brand new program. Um, and as I say, the linking with industry was really, um, you know, uh, encouraged by our donors for this program, the, the Canadians, the International Development Research Centre. Oged, we haven't had any experience of linking with industry. It hasn't been something that we have, you know, been involved with before. Um, and we're learning as we go. We're realising that it's actually really difficult for yeah. academics to understand what linking with industry means and and how to do it it's very very difficult to, to kind of move out of that research headspace into a more kind of commercialized headspace um, at the same time i think most researchers that we work with absolutely recognize that it's a useful necessary fantastic thing to do uh, and they just would like some support and some training um, and explanation how to do that um, so really, you know, I, I guess, as I say, it's an evolving project. We'll, we'll see how it works. But each, each individual researcher, really, it's up to them to, to use the grant in such a way that they can make links. So what does it mean to link with industry? One, one thing that we can provide and we do provide is, is some kind of training in how you might approach businesses. What does it mean to get a patent? I mean, this is incredibly important. I'm sure you're all really aware of that, especially today with all these pharmaceutical project, products, for example, and, you know, having, you know, the, the money for these things going out of the country uh, somewhere else when, when really there, there could be so much coming in. Um, but a lot of that's just not, you know, not knowing how to scale up, for example, which is what linking with industry is all about. You know, you have your, you have this great idea which will solve a problem for your community. 
you work on that, that's what your research is about. Actually, uh, you know, for that to then be rolled out to more people in your country or in your region, there's a lot of different kind of work that needs to be done, but there are other people who are expert in that. So that's why it's called linking with industry. You know, you need to find a way to, to link up with those people, to use the funds from the grant in such a way that you're identifying those people, you're there aware of what you do. You know, so this is like opening up a dialogue, really. We're not expecting you to be experts in industry because you're research scientists, but um, we are expecting you to, you know, be creative uh, and, and, and make connections. And a lot of this, uh, a lot of this grant is about, a lot of it is about teaching, uh, training in collaborating, networking. And that's why the national chapters are fundamental because what you do is you provide opportunities for networking at every level. So you've got the individual research scientist who's on their own in your country. Then you open up the national chapter and they can meet with other scientists. They can uh, break off and get into research groups around their field of interest. They can organize activities that are relevant to their specific interest. They work together. They realize that they're working in the same thing. They're interested in something. You know, that's how things build. So you've got your, you've got your national chapter. You, you imagine if you link all of you with the, the national chapter in Sudan, or, you know, you'll find that you've got a lot of things in common. And because it's regional, you, you don't necessarily literally speak the same language, but you, you have many of the same challenges. And uh, it's a good place to start. And then from regional, you can build out to international. So it's all about building steps. And, uh, I, you know, the sustainability of a project, two years is not very long for us kind of like to accompany you, but you hopefully a thoughtful project is a project that knows how to invest that 50,000 well, that the, the, then things kind of proliferate afterwards. Um, but as I say, it, we're still very new at this, at this particular aspect and we are trying all the time to bring in experts that we can work with, that can provide training, that can give us advice. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think this is uh, very clear and um, uh, in fact, we had some experience with the, the uh, building capacity project with the uh, EU um, on uh, uh, building curriculum for some uh, master programs. And, and there we tried to involve the industry as partner in that project. And this was, uh, that was helpful in some projects that uh, they get involved from the beginning from, for building the curriculum and there we uh, listen to their um, uh, comments, to their feedback. We tried in this project to bridge the gap between the industry and academia. And um, I can say that in some projects, it was really successful stories, uh, others not. But it is, as you mentioned, uh, it's not an easy exercise, but uh, we, uh, we should try keeping and involving uh, them because at the end of the academia, the industry is the place where they will go and, and work and uh, where the benefit should be uh, getting to uh, the, the community uh, um, to improve uh, um, the community in, in different uh, aspects. In fact, one, one last question uh, from uh, Rana. She asked uh, if, if there is a, a strict time to apply for research projects and how to apply. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, they're both, well, the PhD uh, applications are still, uh, oh no, no, they're both, sorry, they're both closed now. They're both closed. So the PhD and the early career fellowships have closed for this year, but uh, I don't think that that's an issue because the early career fellowship really needs a lot of work and a lot of thought, okay? So uh, it will open again, it probably both of them, both the PhD and the early career open around February, March time, and they close around this time, May, June. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you can see all of the information on the website. I think it's, it would be really good now to really start planning, you know, how, how to go about that, that proposal. And that's something that we also would like to do uh, more and better, and that we would love the national chapters to be uh, kind of hosts again for that, like, you know, holding, maybe holding um, information sessions on the different uh, opportunities that OST offers, 
you know, so now you've got my, you'll, you'll have my PowerPoint, you can talk it through with people, uh, you can always check with me anything that you don't, you're not clear about. I can, yeah. I can join in also, I'm happy to do that. Um, but you can host those kind of sessions and then you can also, you know, it'd be great to have some kind of like brainstorming sessions, you know, where would you like to apply? What would you work on? And then look at the grants. What you just talked about, um, Shahan, is about, um, uh, you know, you've, you've obviously identified some best practices for working with industry that people have, have yeah. built. And, and just putting those together and saying, and having them as examples, inviting those people to talk to the national chapter. You know, I am a successful businesswoman. This is how I did it. I managed to link with industry. This was my process. You know, maybe get two or three women yeah. in that position to come and... and uh, I think those kinds of workshops are so valuable. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, one, one last question. Uh, I believe that uh, for uh, mostly for uh, early uh, career fellowship, fellowships and postdoctoral, it is per individual. Can, is, is, can we do something on an, for, for example, for our Palestinian national chapter, is there something we can do collaboratively with others, uh, with, other, with different universities in a national level? Well, wow. as, as, sorry, as, as you maybe know that um, um, all of us come from different universities in Palestine. We'd like to do something together for, the, uh, for our country. So is there uh, something we can do? It in that I, mean, I mean, wow. I, I, you know, I think you guys are wonderful. And I think if, if, you, can, if you can find the right funders, you know, the, the trick is <coughs> with, with, with fundraising is you have to find a match. Yeah. And, um, and I, think, I think right now, well, you know, who knows how much things have changed now with the pandemic and with the economic situation being incredibly difficult globally. But, you know, generally there has been a very big uh, move towards supporting women uh, from developing countries. And maybe now there's a heightened awareness of how useful science can be. It might be that there are specific funders who want to invest in that, in that area. Now we work obviously with CEDA and with IDRC, the Canadians and the Swedes, and we know that they are really, you know, totally into the work that we do. Um, they may well have specific programs that you could apply for. I mean, for any opportunity, it requires, there's, a, there's like a, a lot of steps. You have to have a, First of all, you have to have a concept. You know, yeah. what, is, what is it that we want to do? And, and, and Well, first of all, I would, I would ask myself, what do we want to do? And can we do it without any money at all in the first place, right? Yeah. Just to kick it off, just to get it going. You'll find that there are many, many things that you can do without, without money, in terms, especially in terms of collaboration and, and linking. And, and at the moment, everything's virtual. There's a lot you can do that you don't need an investment. And once, once you do those kind of activities, you've got evidence of cooperation of activity that then is a really good basis to make an application. Um, and you look, you, you, if, if you've got a genuine need for something that is clearly of benefit, then you will find a funder for it. Um, and if you've got the backing, if you can find the right people to support you. So for example, you've got this, your wonderful minister who's clearly, um, you know, 100% behind you, bring him in to everything, <laughs> you know, refer to him, you know, he, he, you've, got, you've got to use your contacts uh, all the time. And, um, you know, it's a bit, I don't know, it's a bit like, uh, you, have to, you have to listen very carefully. You have to find out uh, what the funders are looking for, what they want. And you have to ask yourself, is that what we do? Can we do that? Is that what we're doing already? We just, and then you have to put it in such a language that it's recognizable that what you want is what they want. And it's a win-win situation. You're not begging for money. You're not asking for help. You're saying, look, why wouldn't you? You know, we want to do what you want to do. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the key relationship that you have to find, basically. Um, but we, we're hoping that we'll, we'll also be able to, uh, uh, at the, you know, international O's level, 
get more funding as we move forward for the for the chapters as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, now we can move to the uh, last uh, <laughs> session of the IMO. Yeah, please. Uh, Shahinaz, can I have a question, quick one? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one of my colleagues asked me that those, uh, the PhD and the postdoctor is yearly, annual, because she missed this year. So uh, she wants to be prepared for the next year. So it's every year you offer all those fellowships? That's every, what year. every year. And one more thing, I, I didn't include, I didn't include all the information that you need. Um, <clears throat> for the PhD, for example, and this is why it's good to start working on an application well in advance, you will need to have an acceptance already from the host institute. So one thing is a kind of institutional acceptance and most universities will give you that because they want anybody that may get a grant, of course they want you to come, right? So that's not so important for the actual selection committee. They want to know that somebody at the host institute is really recommending you because of what you're working on and that they believe that what you're working on is something that they can really, that you can do well at their department. So I would suggest that you already start trying to, it's not easy to do, it's a, it's a hard task that we're asking you to do, to find you know, the right institute for you, the right supervisor for you. Uh, again, you need to ask around, you need to get advice maybe from colleagues already at your universities in Palestine, any contacts that you have, maybe through the national chapters also that you can, you can get some information. But identify the right institute, the right supervisor, establish a, a, a correspondence with the person that you want to work with, you know. Uh, we, we, we're often afraid to make links with people that we admire, um, but you know, Again, make it into a win-win situation. I'm really interested in working with you because you're working on this and this is, this is what I'm working on right now and I can bring, you know, I want to develop. Uh, supervisors are, are looking for great students, so. Um. Yeah, and I think also uh, one of the good uh, opportunity that uh, uh, the new um, students who, who would like to apply for a PhD, they can, they can also um, discuss and, and talk with us who have already finished their PhD. We can link them with the other uh, European or American uh, institutions and, and, uh, and that will, will, would like to do that uh, for sure. Absolutely, uh, I think that, those, that, kind of, that kind of sharing is really important. The supervisor, supervisee relationship is not an easy one and any no. advice you can give on that is yeah. incredibly helpful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but, but your scholarship is specific to certain countries. Say, sorry, I didn't hear, Amira. Uh, your scholarships, PhD scholarships, is specific to certain countries. Europe and America is not one of these countries. No, exactly. We, through our fellowship, you can't go and study in Europe or North America, but you can study in any other developing country, which does actually include what we don't really consider to be developing countries anymore. South Africa, China, Brazil, India, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. So if we don't have uh, any more questions, uh, so we can move now to the uh, next session, the last one. Okay, so our final program, which Amira knows all about, this is a program <laughs> of visibility. So, um, this is the notion, so if you, if you remember, going back over this talk, first important component, community. Finding people that are working in your field, that think like you do, can support you, recognize the same challenges and solutions. <clears throat> Second is mobility, the need to leave home in order to get the expert resources uh, that you need in order to progress to the next level. Stability or capacity building, being able to stay at home and build up uh, excellent research team. The final component is visibility, making sure that women researchers who are exceptional in their field are seen. And why is that important? It's, it's important for, uh, first of all, I'm sure you all totally understand the importance of role models. So if uh, a young uh, girl in a, a school in Palestine sees, maybe sees a mirror up on this stage with this award in her hand and on the front page of the national newspaper, or then, you know, she might think, wow, 
somebody I know or somebody who I could know um, has achieved this, that means, you know, why, why couldn't I? I might be able to do that too. And that's incredibly important. Um, but it's also important, not just for those women that I follow, but just to say, look, uh, you remember that black and white photograph I showed right at the beginning of the men in the lab. It's just, to, you know, to bring the color and the diversity into science and, you know, splash it around whenever you can, you know, just show off all of the people who are really contributing to science to change that image. Because as soon as you change the image, then people who do not fit that image will feel that they can participate and that they can uh, apply the things. And that's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, it's also it's also visibility for saying, you know, well done. You were, you are successful in an incredibly challenging situation. Women from developing countries have, you know, got a lot of dice stacked against them in terms of becoming scientific researchers. And, you know, it's time to celebrate and recognize and reward. And uh, I don't know if Amira will say this, we've got, we've got two other uh, of our prize winners on the call and maybe others that I haven't noticed that Huda Basalim also received the uh, award many, many years ago. And uh, Tabasum Mumtaz from Bangladesh uh, more recently. So um, these women, uh, you know, are, are are important role models and uh, they they really, uh, I'm sure each of these three women that I've named are uh, also, Amira has taken it upon herself to be, you know, instrumental in setting up this national chapter. And that's, that's, that's part of the whole cycle of how this award scheme works really. Um, so here's a lovely photograph. There's Amira next to Tabasum. <laughs> And uh, we have our awardees also from Nepal and from Gambia and from uh, Bolivia. Um, and here we can see um, Narel Paniagua from Bolivia working in the field. I've chosen to, to uh, just follow up with Narel because uh, I think Amira is well aware of this as well, is that uh, Narel, because um, uh, the award was, you know, in, the, in all the international papers and the, uh, the Bolivian, we went to visit the Bolivian national chapter in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And as a consequence, um, she was invited by the then uh, president of, uh, of Bolivia to an interview with him. That's the photograph there. And he tweeted about their visit. Um, so that's incredibly high profile for you. And she was... Uh, um, this is a, a, a wall mural that was done to celebrate her achievements also. And another one of our awardees from Uganda, the similar thing happened with her. She, uh, she was celebrated and got, she was then given uh, an award medal by her president of Uganda. Um, so they say that, you know, prizes attract prizes. And once you get, once you start on that, on that route, people recognize and continue to recognize you. You get points, they contribute. If you're applying for a grant and you can say that you've won an award, you know, the reviewers look at you again and they say, oh, she's been given an award, then she must be good. And, you know, it just reproduces like this. Um, most awards are won by men. And so they continue to accumulate <laughs> in, that, in that kind of self fulfilling prophecy cycle. So we're trying to break that cycle a bit here. Ah, and I've already come to the end. <laughs> uh, I should just give you, tell you a little bit more about what this award though consists of. Let me go back to the photo with Amira and Tabasum in it. Um, so the award actually um, is a modest award. It's only $5,000, um, but can be put to very good use by the awardees, I'm sure. And then each year so far, private donors have given an additional $2,500 uh, to be used uh, for research purposes. Um, but the, the importance of this award is that uh, the awardees receive their award during uh, a big international conference that's held in a different American city each year. It's called the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. There are thousands of participants in this conference and we have a standing invitation uh, to this kind of networking event where uh, we, where the awardees present their research in front of, you know, maybe 300 
people who hear about their research and very often they're contacted by people that have listened to them and they may offer them other opportunities during the week we spend a week in the in the city and we try and um, find lots of opportunities because we were in washington that year we visited uh, the uh, different embassies and this was incredibly useful uh, obviously it wasn't possible uh, to visit the palestinian <laughs> embassy uh, that year but um yeah so uh, i don't know if amira if amira would like to say uh, amira tabasum or um also huda would like to say anything about the impact that that award has had on on you that was my question so thank you tonya <laughs> yeah maybe maybe shahnaz you can direct it to tabasum please tabasum is with Sorry, us and uh, maybe you please can amira. direct the, yeah you can hear me shahnaz Yes, yes, please. Go can, ahead. You please can you please direct that question to Tabassum? Thanks. To who? Tabassum, Tabassum, she's with us. She's yeah, in hello. Bangladesh. Okay, I see. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, and the middle in the picture. <laughs> Hi, Tabassum. We are so happy Hi, yeah. to have you uh, with us. Yeah, so, me too. Yeah, um, uh, as, uh, as Amira requested, so I would like to hear uh, from you about uh, the impact of uh, uh, the award on your life, um, which uh, the being uh, visible to all of uh, uh, women. Um, we, um, uh, I remember when Amira uh, got uh, this award, we all uh, celebrated uh, that success of Amira as we all got that uh, award and we we're very happy. So I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, that award uh, had a very a great impact on you. So could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really an uh, extraordinary uh, achievement and um, uh, I must say that it gives a big impact on your uh, research or uh, um, the way you are thinking or the way people think about you. Um, it's like uh, the research, for the research we have received this uh, award and uh, the research maybe uh, we have done it a few years back, but the taste of it, the impact of this research we received uh, after a couple of years. So it gives you a, a sort of satisfaction of doing research, uh, even though you were in uh, amidst uh, so many, you know, uh, so many uncertainties during your PhD, because we, we need to balance our family. Uh, we are apart, uh, abroad, in abroad, so we are um, apart from our family. So all these challenges we have overcome and somehow, I mean, uh, we get our degree and then uh, this uh, award it makes you feel like, uh, I mean, uh, you, you will be more passionate towards research, doing research. And uh, I feel like OSD and the uh, LCBA Foundation, they're doing uh, great uh, in this regard. They are um, sort of uh, uh, making us to see uh, beyond the horizon. So you can, you can think uh, more, you can uh, do more research and you have more uh, integrity in your uh, research area. So, yeah, I think it's it's, it's uh, uh, incredible feelings. Thank you. Tabassum, you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Oh, yeah, I'm from uh, Bangladesh. I'm a principal scientific officer. I'm a biologist. Um, I work on the microbial conversion of waste in, into uh, bioplastic, biohydrogen. Um, yeah, I'm in uh, Atomic Energy Commission. And yeah. together with Amira Narel, uh, we got uh, we received the award last year. Thank you. That was that was great. Tabassum, uh, Tabassum I um, I understood from your uh, uh, talking that uh, you have uh, children. Yes. Yeah, I have two kids. How 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 uh, that um, the award uh, affects your image uh, in the eyes of your kids? Um. Yeah, well, they, they always uh, feel proud when they um, introduce their mom to their uh, uh, classmates that, yes, my mom is a scientist. So they think high, <laughs> uh, high of uh, their mom. And um, 
and since they uh, from the childhood they know that okay my mom is going for a conference abroad and she will be back or she is away so they have sort of um, um how to say uh, they adjusted this one they they yeah. think it's okay they are not like nagging uh, that you have to be with me all, all the time so they also think independently uh, to do their things uh, my younger one is uh, seven year and the elder one is uh, 12 so they are not uh, too grown up yet but they are still very considerate so that's a good part of it i think uh, and i always share with them uh, whatever i do whatever what are the activities um, even my younger kid she was asking that uh, mom is sonia a uh, osd fellow so i was like laughing at <laughs> uh, she already know what is fellow and what is member <laughs> so i said no she is a coordinator she is uh, handling all the activities that the national chapters uh, are doing so yeah mm, the elder one uh, was born uh, in between my phd so when i was halfway of my phd uh, she was born and it still was okay i was doing phd in upm malaysia uh, still uh, i could handle the newborn and my research work because my husband was also there he was also doing phd and he was helping me a lot Yes, so that's a plus point, and I'm fortunate that I could do 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 my PhD with my husband. Yeah, yeah I'm that's I'm better. really lucky. They should be proud of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thanks to uh, Almighty. Uh, as you mentioned, you have uh, kids in, at schools. Antonia mentioned uh, one of the um, important points that we should advocate for. Uh, a woman a scientist uh, as, a, as a scientist and, and uh, visit the schools, promote for uh, women. Uh, yes. So uh, w uh, after getting this award, uh, how did you uh, do uh, and, and promote these things? Um, uh, and, and another question I would like to ask you, um, getting the award, um, was there any any impact on opening some more doors for you for research on a national levels and uh, uh, Ministry of Education, for example? If you can uh, uh, give me some um, uh, information on that, please. Yeah, uh, uh, regarding uh, the yeah, uh, once I talk to uh, once I visit um, the Secretary of our Ministry of Science and Technology, he was. Like I was explaining how uh, about this award and how I get it or what are the achievements that I have uh, to have it. So he was quite surprised and he was very um, enthusiastic and interested to help me for my research. And uh, then I got a uh, research grant from International Atomic Ed uh, en um, Energy Agency. Um, I also applied for early career uh, fellowship. So I got the IEA uh, research scheme, which is a very uh, uh, small uh, grant, but I think it's, uh, it's a very good for the beginner. Um, well, uh, it may have the impact, of course, like um, Tonya mentioned that we got more visibility. Uh, you can just Google my name and can uh, see uh, the, what are the things I have done and, uh, 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 and the achievements. So it, 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 it also it, it gives, um, of course, a positive uh, impact to get a research grant. And uh, I am also um, acting as a secretary of our national chapter, Bangladesh national chapter. So wherever or where, whenever we uh, try to promote all these activities, uh, we also emphasize the importance of science in education in, uh, for girls and women. So in school and in uh, college or in university level, we try to let them inspire by saying that well i was in science and i was thinking like i have to be in science um there's no uh, option that i i would go for other uh, discipline and and here i am and uh, you can see me and can get get inspired and also that uh, maintaining family and uh, doing research we can do it's not impossible so it still can be achieved Something like that. Thank you, Tabassum. I think we have also Huda uh, from uh, Yemen, I guess. Uh, yeah. Huda. Yeah. Yes. 
Hello, thank Uda. you. Thank you all. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, maybe I have long history with OST. I am an OST member since 2005. And at the same year, I have I got my PhD fellowship from OST in 2005, and I studied in Malaysia. Uh, I completed my study in 2009, and I, I, I mean, I attended all the General Assembly of OST since the third General Assembly. And then I grew with OST. Actually, I can say that grow with us a real world for me. Um, this is very motivational for me, very inspirational for me. In 2013, I got the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Elsevier Award in Life Science, and I got my, uh, I mean, the, um, the celebration in Boston that, the, that year. I remember one important event in 2013 during the um, the, the ceremony, I mean, they took us to visit the Harvard University and to spend long day, the whole day in Harvard University, in laboratories, um, uh, hearing lectures, um, see how they receive students and so on. I cannot, I mean, forget, uh, forget this uh, experience at all. So um, it, it, it make me, uh, I mean, uh, yes, I got the, uh, the, the Elsevier Award, but during our visit to Harvard University, I become more aware about the importance of research and the quality research, actually. You know, we are in a country like Yemen and some other country like uh, we are living in, we have not all these capacities in research, all this, I mean, uh, infrastructure for research, but still we have to make something good with this minimum thing. So this is very important for me, that award in 2013. And then, as I said, um, also I continue with the OZ, we, uh, through our national chapter, I am the, um, the Secretary General also of the, uh, the Yemeni national chapter, uh, because at that time there was only the Egyptian national chapter and the Yemen national chapter. So we try to make a lot, uh, many uh, members as possible, you know, girls in Yemen, uh, and not only girls, we have instability in Yemen. We are living in long period of instability. I don't want to go ahead in this, but it is not easy to have member in this situation, but still we work to have more member and member uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, in us. In 2016, like what uh, dear Tony has said, I have been elected as the regional member for the Arab region. And this is another, I mean, motivational uh, experience for me. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, many, I am the head of, at uh, that time, I was the head of the Department of Community Medicine and uh, Public Health in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Aden. Many, many of our, um, I mean, junior staff ask about OST, what is OST, they want to be member of OST. Um, my daughter also, um, she has some interest, not at the, at, at, in science, but become more interested in science. She completed her bachelor in um, architecture engineering and doing now her master degree in uh, architecture engineering in Malaysia. So I think being with OST, as a member, looking forward to have some of these um, opportunities provided by us is very, very promotional and very, very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Uh, Tonya, would you like to, uh, uh, to mention anything regarding the award? Uh, what are the criteria? I, I know that it is already on the website of the... Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Arij is raising her hand. Okay, thank you, Amira. Uh, please, Arij. Uh, Amira is the admin, so I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't see that she's raising her hand. Please, Arij. Okay, it's okay. Thank you, Shahnaz. Thank you, Amira. Tonya, it has been a great, a great, wonderful lecture, and sure we will use it. I don't know if Amira told you, but we are starting to do this. Uh, uh, awareness of our national chapter in our local universities, like I'm starting one in my own university and we will use this, it's, it's a great lecture. I have a comment. 
and I think I need you to have really a white chest to hear it. <laughs> I think there is something unfair regarding the female MDs. Like uh, the OWSD does not recognize the MD, the medical doctor equivalent to BHD, which makes them uneligible for any of the fellowships, scholarships, most of them. And if you just think about how much the MD spent in her life to reach to this degree, it's seven years, which is a master, PA, and a PhD. And in addition, most of them went for specialty, which is an additional four years, which make the total of more than 12 years in studying medicine. And from my own experience as MD in Palestine, I can tell you that most of my MD colleagues are really very, very enthusiastic to make research. And if we don't give them the opportunity for having this fund, fellowship, and all of these things that are really constricted to either proper PhD or post PhD, you are really letting out a lot of very clever scientists who are really doing a lot for medical research and they are doing, trying their best. So when I try to promote the national chapter to the MDs, most of them, when they looked at the fellowships and the scholarships, the early career, the PhD, they all were a bit reluctant because it does not include them. And most of the international organizations really recognize PhD or equivalent, PhD or equivalent, which is an MD. So I think maybe we are really overlooking a great part of the female scientists who really spent a lot of years in their study to reach to this level. And this will make research in the medical field is really deficient. And I went through a lot of studies that had the OWSD members and really the MDs, I mean the medical, pure medical research is the least research that is there because the fund does not include somebody who is not PhD or post PhD. So I'm not sure if you can elaborate on this. Uh, thank you. You can probably hear some bells now going off. This is, I live right next to the cathedral and it's, <laughs> the bells are, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, we, we uh, I mean, as far as I know, we have, uh, we have a description of the, that the MD is eligible. And Odak as well, Odak is a pediatrician and she was, she was one of the receiver of the uh, Elsevier EF award, the one in the picture. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a description about, I mean, as long as the uh, MD is, in a research, is, is research orientated, then it's, then it's acceptable. Well, I did not see this very clear in a lot of uh, the awards. I mean, it certainly doesn't anywhere say that it's not acceptable. And then there yes, is. Yes, it is not, not, but there's nothing like PhD or equivalent, like this word. I did not find it. A PhD or equivalent is a. Uh, I mean, I'm just having a look now. I'm just trying to see exactly how it's worded. But the. I mean,. I mean, basically, I can I can also send a link after this uh, this um, this talk, but uh, that that's not the case anyway. M MDs are are accepted. It's um, we I think if we don't have the wording PhD or equivalent, it's just because um, that can cause a lot of uh, confusion and inquiries, possibly. But um, I think. I think it's I think it's 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 pretty clear in the eligibility criteria what uh, what is considered to be a, a PhD. I'm just trying to have a look underneath. Um, I mean, so it's only really relevant to the early career the early career fellowship, the membership, and the uh, awards, right? 
Okay, good. If this is the case, good, because that what I did not understand this from the, the eligibility criteria. No, I'll, I'll, I'll follow it up anyway and send, you, and send you the link. But I mean, this, has, this is something that's come up a few times. And um, I mean, actually, it hasn't come up that often. We haven't received that many inquiries about it. But when it has come up, um, we've, we've uh, you know, we've said that as long as it's, uh, because it's research, we're, we're funding research, uh, as long as the uh, MD is in, you know, is, is research orientated then it's acceptable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harish, for raising this question. It's really important because at the end, uh, the MD, they are also scientists and they are, they are doing research and very important research. We, well, actually, not all of them. So there's a, a good bond that Tonya said, as far as they are research oriented, I believe they they, they are part of the other researchers, should not be excluded. Do you have any other questions, uh, Shainaz? Uh, for me, no. Uh, so I, uh, I was very happy to join uh, this, uh, 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 this lecture of today. And um, uh, thank you, Tonya, uh, for the information you give. Thank you, Amira, for organizing for all of you to attending this uh, um, lecture. And uh, I leave it now to you, Amira. Thanks a lot, Shahinas. Uh, and uh, all of you, thanks all for attending this fruitful lecture. Uh, the thanks go is going to Tonya, who gave us like a, um, her time. I know that she's very busy, yet she was able to deliver this amazing uh, um, uh, speech and this uh, very simple way. And uh, thanks to all of our participants, to uh, the monitors of uh, who monitors the uh, Dr. Khatib and Dr. Shainaz, who monitor the QA sessions. And uh, this is the second, and there are many other um, sessions or like webinars will come. Uh, so we would love to have you in these webinars. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we recorded this um, webinar, so like it will be soon in your inbox. So check your inbox, please. Thanks a lot. Have a nice Thank evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amira, for, for hosting. I, I really enjoyed this. I th it's so great to be connected with you all, and um, you're doing a fantastic job and um, really well, well, um, well prepared and well planned this this session as well. I think. Uh, Great things will come. Thank you very much for Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Shahinaz. Yes, Amira. Kalik ya shan tahki la an kif amal azal hadi. Recording. Ah, okay. Ila halha automatic. So just end the. End so the just end, end, yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. yeah. uh, okay. you end. Like when you end, Rahiji uh, Ulek, do like uh, two choices. Yeah, in my iCloud, but I don't know. Or you can record it, download it on your laptop. So he, they will ask you where to save it. But okay. when you okay. End. okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you, Amira, Shahinaz. Everybody, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.